she's everywhere I turn a shade of blue and I didn't come back here to stay I'm just a ghost boy walking through The Bone Dolls Twin by Lynn Flew Elling is a 2001 fantasy novel taking place in a fictionalized medieval European region with a country reminiscent of Britain called Scala. It's the first entry in a trilogy called the Tamir Triad, a prequel to Flew Elling's existing Night Runner series, which I have not read in order to review Bone Dolls Twin solely within its own context. The Tamir Triad focuses on the ascension of a princess as the true heir to the throne in a line of matriarchal succession to usurp the tyrannical rule of her murderous patriarchal uncle in a feminist story that appears to be loosely inspired by Hamlet. A transgender element is prominent in the story, as Princess Tamir is disguised as her stillborn twin Prince Tobin, magically transformed into what he would have been and raised as a young prince with her true gender a secret even to her. The majority of the book focuses on her and her Prince Tobin persona, being raised as a young prince in a lonely rural castle, and is largely a ghost story about the haunting of her brother, a specter referred to simply as Brother. Prompted by visions of their roles in the shaping of the future, Oriska wizards Ia and her apprentice Arconiel work with a folk witch named Lel to help deliver the twins. When the boy is found stillborn, Lel performs mysterious folk magic to make the girl take his form. In the process, an angry ghost emerges. Despite the Oriska wizard's best efforts, Brother enters the girl to haunt her. I believe this technically makes him a debuk, a kind of ghost from Jewish folklore that haunts a person instead of a place or object. Lel artificially binds him to a doll using parts of his bone to make him easier to control. She gives the doll to the mother, Ariani, with instructions to keep it close. Lel is the most prominent person of color in the book, if not the only one. There are characters from another culture that might be coded as a culture of color like the Romani or Arabs, but I'm honestly unsure what the author was trying to broadcast them as. All of the other characters are white as far as I can tell. Her role is the apparently primitive witch looked down upon by the proper respectable Orisco wizards is very stereotypical, but it's done in a generally progressive way where it's made clear that her culture and way of doing magic is perfectly legitimate and that it's wrong of the Orisco wizards to look down on her. However, even though it's made very clear that most of the other characters are white, racism is not described as an active element, only classism, so there might still be a problem with the framing. After establishing that the girl child must be raised as a boy, the book phases into the character's perspective with the name Tobin and male pronouns, which are used for 99% of the book. We get to know young Tobin as he feels out the world around him, like any child does, but with added gender identity and role issues. There are clear parallels to being transgender and or intersex. Modern doctors use a notoriously unreliable method of sexing newborns based on the size of external genitalia. Large clitorises may be interpreted as small penises, and small penises may be interpreted as large clitorises, and anything within a certain ambiguous range is considered a problematic intersex state, prompting surgery to induce an unambiguous single-sex state. Intersex individuals will often manifest gender dysphoria with their assigned sex and seek transition to the other sex later in life, often facing trauma as a result of the efforts to maintain the single sex form forced on their bodies. It's easy to see how Tobin could be considered a fantasy version of an intersex character, forced into a wrong sex at birth when fantasy doctors perform fantasy surgery. It also just works as a metaphor for being transgender, with a clear fantasy origin story, the main gender dysphoria element in the first two-thirds of the book occurs during a birthday celebration when Tobin's father, Duke Rius, asks him to pick out a present. He finds himself attracted to a doll, which he relates to his mother's bone doll, but his father freaks out and makes him accept a present that he deems more masculine, a set of marbles. Rius later insists that he try out the more masculine hobby of fighting. This resonates throughout the book as Tobin outwardly devotes himself to combat training and secretly develops a preoccupation with the bone doll. This is a fairly accurate and respectful depiction of a young transgender girl's experience with trying something of a feminine gender role and being booted out of it. While the doll as a girl's toy represents a stereotypical facet of the feminine gender role, this is not extrapolated to the assumption that a trans girl would only seek out items of stereotype. 
The doll is not even associated specifically with femininity, just Tobin's appreciation of his mother and her possession and wanting an item like it to imitate her as a beloved family member. It's a realistic girl's desire, without reduction into the stereotypical conceptions of gender, to make the transgender subject more digestible by a cis-hetero main audience, as can happen with media such as Ranma One Half, for which diversion into sexism is inevitable. Duke Rias insisting Tobin embrace fighting as a masculine hobby creates a passion for martial skills that follows him throughout the book. Tobin lives and breathes fighting. What's interesting is that the passion is real. He continues to long for the doll, but that is a separate personality trait to his interest in fighting. He never would have gotten into fighting so strongly if his father didn't try so hard to keep him away from the female gender role, but it becomes a real passion of his. He grows into the masculine role to advance his relationship with his father while suppressing a real longing to fulfill an aspect of the feminine role to improve his relationship with his mother. The interest in masculine fighting versus feminine nurturing, as represented by the bone doll, is the main thematic duality of Tobin's gender. Tobin also has a more gender-neutral passion, carving sculptures. His father makes him a realistic model of Arrow, Scala's capital city. It's only a model. Shh. And Tobin takes to carving his own sculptures and giving them as presents to the servants. Because his main example of carving is the model city, an objective representation of a real-world entity, he develops an objectivist conception of the world. He never imagines what could be and tries to render it, only analyzes what is and tries to recreate it on a smaller scale. When the idea of pretending to be something he is not is presented to him, he finds it truly horrific, like pretending to be a bird would be Animorph's body horror. This lack of imagination is juxtaposed with his reluctance to probe deep inside his psyche and his acceptance of the masculine persona. Throughout all of this, he is haunted by Brother. Acting like a poltergeist, Brother throws stuff around and destroys things in infantile tantrums. Dead as a baby, Brother is in stasis as a baby, evoking figures like Peter Pan and Claudia from Anne Rice's Vampire Chronicles, inspired by child relatives of the authors who died then written to be supernatural beings to exist forever as children with horrors associated. Brother exists as a special kind of horrific monster, a baby with destructive power. They will be met with fire and fury like the world has never seen. The stress of the haunting, and having to keep the secret, drives Ariane insane. Tobin tries to have a nice relationship with her, but she pulls away, and he's reluctant to be around when she raves. It's comparable to living with a senile grandparent. When she becomes afraid that her brother, the king, would try to kill Tobin, she decides to jump to her death and to force Tobin to fall with her, but he wrestles free and she falls to her death. Trauma over this event haunts him alongside brother's physical haunting, and Ariane's own ghost shows up to haunt her former quarters. In the way that Boondall's twin retells Hamlet, Ariane takes the role of Gertrude. Hamlet's mother, who keeps secret her suspicions that Claudius killed her husband to marry her and take over the kingdom, and who ultimately drinks poisoned wine, in order to escape from the stress of life with that certainty. Ariane also fulfills a madwoman in the attic trope common to Gothic literature. In the 1979 feminist literary analysis book The Mad Woman in the Attic, authors Sandra Gilbert and Susan Gubar describe how Gothic literature has an angel-mad woman dichotomy for its female characters, where women are either written as caregivers who can do no wrong, or monsters embarrassing to their families who are hidden away, such as in an attic. We can compare to the Madonna whore dichotomy. Bondal's twin pays homage to gothic literature with this trope, but it doesn't recreate the problematic dichotomy as other female characters like Ia and Lel and Tobin lead to a diversity of portrayals. Lel steps in to help Tobin control Brother. She uses Tobin's blood to connect him to the doll that Brother is also connected to, and this channel allows Tobin to summon, banish, and somewhat control Brother, alongside the recital of a spell. Now feeling extremely isolated, with his mother dead and father showing toxic masculine coldness, Tobin starts treating Brother like a friend, even though Brother does not have that capacity. Under Lel's instruction, he draws a face on the bone doll, finishing what Ariane never could, but also humanizing the specter. Brother horrifically develops past an eternal monster baby with power to a monster child with personality and the ability to speak, as well as his existing destructive power. 
He seemingly tries to reciprocate Tobin's friendship, but does so in a twisted manner, filling Tobin's head with horrifying visions and lashing out when Tobin is inconvenienced. Brother is a thematic extension of Tobin's psyche, like the other half of a bicameral mind. As Tobin deteriorates in his relative isolation, he projects his desire for family on this undead monstrosity. His struggles with gender roles become embodied in Brother. Brother is bound to the bone doll, which is associated with femininity as a doll, and Tobin has to keep it hidden in his mother's old chambers, like he keeps hidden his own femininity. As Tobin is enchanted to look exactly like Brother, Brother also represents the false masculine persona bound to him. Tobin has him for company, but can never truly befriend him, and he wallows in a state of stagnation. Arconiel rides into the castle to check on things, and finds this bizarre state of affairs. He wants to help Tobin, but Tobin is suspicious of him as a foreign authority figure. Brother holds a grudge against him for his part in Brother's death, and Tobin is inclined to trust Brother's judgment. Arconiel decides that what Tobin needs is a boy his age to be a real friend to him. Duke Rius agrees, but is worried that the boy might find out Tobin's secret, so he makes Arconiel promise to kill him if that ever happens. Arconiel writes to Ia, and she selects a young bastard son of a disgraced rural nobleman. Everyone knows going in that it's the sort of task that requires someone expendable, but the family is in dire enough straits that they agree to it. It calls to mind Chinese stories about sons of poor families selling themselves into slavery to keep their families afloat. While technically noble, they're functionally working class, and introduce another element about class differences into the story. The boy, Ki, has zero markers of the upper middle class status of Tobin's world, and must be taught proper manners to be fit as a companion of the king's nephew. By virtue of not growing up with servants doing everything for him, he knows much more about the world and how to do things than Tobin does. He admires Tobin's passion for fighting, as that's a more physical activity than most favored by nobles, and they're able to teach each other different fighting styles, coming from their different backgrounds. This is paralleled by Arconiel developing a relationship with Lel. As an Arisco wizard, he has assumptions of superiority, but finds that Lel has magic he cannot fathom. After several unsuccessful attempts to recreate her wormhole spell, he humbly submits to her instruction, breaking his oath of celibacy to pay her with sexual favors. He admits that the Oresca way of doing things isn't perfect, and shows respect for her by doing things her way. The sexual dimension is handled respectfully, for Arconiel's viewpoint doesn't frame it as a male fantasy of getting to sleep with a hot witch, as it very easily could have been. He's attracted to her, but honestly conflicted, because it goes against the rules of his religious order, and the choice to break his vows is consensual, but realistically reluctant. He goes through this whole process of writing to Ia and she giving him permission to experiment, before he's willing to take the plunge. I'm concerned that Lil might be portrayed as a bit of a horny savage, racist character trope, but on the other hand, there is a point about her having access to power that the Oresca lack, because she understands more about the world and isn't prudish. To be perfectly honest, I feel this subplot was gratuitously thrown in because of this expectation of sex scenes in adult novels. This is why I typically prefer young adult fiction. She and Arconiel then become parental figures watching over Tobin. Tobin gets on well with Key. He offers something as a peer that Tobin can't get from the servants or brother as a real friend. Also, Tobin is attracted to menfolk, so he feels the first stirrings of romantic attraction. As gay behavior is acknowledged in this world, if not totally condoned, a skull and boy attracted to a boy is not necessarily a transgender element, but happens to be so in this case. Tobin doesn't know how to interpret it, and just fawns over Key as his best friend forever. Things are shaken up when Duke Rius dies in battle, in such a way as to suggest that the king might have arranged it. Lord Orun, a pompous jackass emissary of the king, arrives to take Tobin to Arrow, to be a companion of the heir prince. Oren is an obnoxious politician with foppish traits and favors relations with men, so I might consider him a homophobic stereotype, if not for the good portrayal of other gay characters, which round it out. However, his portrayal is fatphobic. There are no good fat characters to even it out, and we're treated to Tobin's disdainful commentary, associating fatness with the weakness of the upper class. Arconio leads Tobin to have Brother make trouble until Oren agrees to let Tobin take Key and Castle Servants, so he doesn't have to go alone. Arconio instructs Tobin to keep the bone doll with him, hidden. Keep it secret. Keep it secret. 
stupid shit. And to never make brother known to anyone, and to never let people know that the stillborn twin was male and not female, as is necessary to maintain the deception. Tobin never liked Arconiel, but he comes to appreciate him as an authority figure just because he hates the other guy so much. Lel leaves Tobin with the instruction that when he sees blood, he needs to find her right away, but she refuses to elaborate. Tobin and Key join Prince Corrin's royal companions in court. Oren tries to install his own agent as Tobin's squire, but Master Porion, the guy in charge of policing the companions, hates Oren too and promotes Key to the standing needed to assume the position, allowing Tobin to select him as his squire. As royal companions, they have to follow certain rules, like that they have to settle disputes by discussion or formal duels in the practice arena. Absolutely no fighting allowed outside of the arena. They are initially received poorly because they weren't raised in court and don't know the upper-class manners, in parallel to Keys joining Tobin. But Prince Corrin takes a liking to them. When they show off their dueling skills, most of the royal companions accept them, save for a few bullies. The bullies hassle Key about only becoming a squire on a technicality, they insult his family and his class, and he just takes it. And then they insinuate that the reason Tobin cares about him is because Tobin is gay, which is kind of true. But Key is homophobic, sees that as a horrific insult, and gets physical. Later on, Theron, a former servant of Rius, takes him aside and explains that he and Rius had a thing earlier in life, and there's nothing wrong with gay behavior. And they don't seem to have a concept of orientation, just behavior. Key kind of accepts that, but still thinks that it's important to defend his prince's honor by shielding him from gay accusations. So when Porian questions Key what he was responding to, he doesn't repeat the insult, and the penalty is very harsh. Tobin has to whip him and practically breaks down doing it. Key just takes it, counting even though he doesn't have to, feeling that Tobin's reputation is most important. A lot of intrigue happens at court. Tobin starts to realize that he has no interest in girls, while Key does. Tobin sees evidence that the whole society used to be a matriarchy a generation ago, but like his gender identity, he has no idea how to interpret it. Various things happen with blood to remind him of Lil's warning, but he doesn't know for sure until he wakes up with a bloody crotch. Assuming he has the bubonic plague, he drops everything to take a horse straight to Lil. He forgets the bone doll in his hurry, so Brother appears to Key, gets him to fetch the bone doll, and head after Tobin. Key becomes symbolically aware of Tobin's femininity through the doll. Tobin makes it to Lel's place, and she and Arconiel take care of him. Throughout the book, Lel has been referencing the power of the moon. The moon, of course, is symbolic of menstruation. Tobin's underlying female body's development of menstruation damages the transformation spell. So Lel has to redo it. She removes the damaged spell, and Tobin, Tamir, finally realizes her gender identity in a shocking, glorious reveal. However, in the midst of Lel reworking the spell, Brother takes the bone doll from Key and returns it to Tamir, something he was only able to do because Key brought the bone doll that close to Tamir. Arconiel realizes that Key knows too much, and he runs off to fulfill his promise to kill Key. Tamir magically observes Arconiel standing over Key, but her vision vanishes when Lil puts the transformation spell back into place. The book concludes on the ambiguous note, where we don't know for sure if Arconiel kills Key, and on Tamir's horror as she must resume her false masculine persona once again. Based on what I've heard of the author's general gay positivity, I believe the similarity to a transgender person's narrative is entirely intentional. It may be an attempt to let cishet folks empathize, which makes the male pronouns when getting into Tobin's head important to comprehension. With the understanding that the character is naturally female, there is an understanding of an innate gender identity, something that transcends bodily form. Observing Tobin growing up as a boy with male pronouns really brings home the points of gender dysphoria, something that Tobin cannot understand because the possibility of being a girl was never introduced to him, yet understandable by the reader's greater perspective, similar to what a transgender person deals with growing up. However, 
It only works with the premise that this metaphor is the only example of trans people in this world. The emphasis on Tamir's natural body being the real Tamir delegitimizes literal trans people who would find the natural body the prison and who would seek out Lil's magic as an act of self-actualization. With the omission of some line about Lil using magic that was originally developed for trans people for the sake of a disguise, it reduces trans people to a theoretical concept, something portrayed by metaphor alone. Trans people are effectively erased from this world. You can make up different societies all you want, but there are some universalities to the human population, and when you ignore the existence of marginalized demographics, it ends up socially problematic. Feminist-wise, it's pretty good. Even with a mad woman in the attic, we get an even-handed depiction of female characters. The depiction of a society that used to be matriarchal very recently, and has been turned oppressively patriarchal, gives it a resemblance to Handmaid's Tale. Tobin is an unaware trans girl who respects women as a matter of fact, uneasily observing the way cisgender boys very easily accept the patriarchal status quo and associated misogyny, presents an interesting viewpoint on the tale. Entertainment-wise, it has its difficulties as a narrative. I had trouble getting into the book, and it seems like a lot of people have trouble with the first 50 pages or so, only finding it interesting after then. A lot of people find it hard to appreciate Tobin, and yeah, I get it. In the effort to show his tortured existence, he doesn't have a lot to do but wallow. It takes Arconiel's return for him to have someone to play off of, and it doesn't get really interesting until Key shows up. Compare this to Hamlet, who wallows and broods, but has interesting things to say, even when he's talking to himself. And of course, his ghost talks back. Brother is generally creepy, but the story never truly gets scary. This is no haunting of Hill House. I don't think of it as a proper ghost story, so much as a fantasy story that has ghosts in it, and also wizards. It also inherits a problem from Hamlet, where it doesn't quite make sense that ghosts are so rare, when the traumatic incidents said to produce ghosts really aren't that rare. At least there's no equivalent to the line, that undiscovered country from whose born no traveler has returned, after we know ghosts exist. I think the book's biggest problem is that it's set up for a trilogy. I imagine the third book, The Oracle's Queen, has a great payoff. I imagine the Hamlet themes get turned up to 11 with intrigue and murder, but Bone Doll's twin is defined by setup. That's not to say I didn't enjoy it. I totally shipped on Mayor and Key. I hope Arconiel didn't kill him off. It's just flawed, and the flaws do temper my overall enjoyment. If anyone were to commission a review of the second book, Hidden Warrior, I would be interested to see what is done with the plot, but it's probably not something that I would read on my own. I didn't come back here to stay I'm just a ghost boy walking through Please like, share, subscribe, follow me on Twitter, and send me an email if you want to commission a video review, and click the link below to support me on Patreon. Pledges of $5 or more will earn you a special thank you at the end of each video. Thank you, and please check out my related videos.